and then we start up with the session. Okay, so can you hear me? Perfect. Yeah. So let's start with the first session and we have a first presentation. Um, I'm not sure whether I pronounced the name right. Um, it's uh, Hang Shan Wu, is that right? I hope so. Yes. yes. And uh, he's research fellow in the Department of Economics at Trinity College um, in Dublin. And today he will present about are EU citizens willing to engage with community-based energy corporations? And he make use of a uh, cross-country choice experiment. So the floor is yours. OK, thank you very much. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining this session. Uh, my name is Hang Jian Wu, a research fellow at Trinity College Dublin. Um, today, I would like to share uh, some of our recent findings from the Scripture experiment uh, regarding uh, citizens who want to engage with energy cooperatives. So this research is a part of the social rights project funded by the European Commission. So first, uh, I would like to give some highlights of this uh, research. We investigate citizens' intention to invest in renewable projects operated by energy cooperatives. We conduct a large scale uh, discrete choice experiment in different European countries. And the results suggest that citizen investment decision uh, are motivated by both financial returns and environment concerns. Okay, so first let me uh, introduce the motivation of this research. Um, as you may know that uh, climate change has been a global threat and the EU governments have implemented a series of policy to tackle the problem. And one goal is to increase the renewable uptake uh, in different sectors. According to the, the European Green Deal, the, the EU countries aim to achieve an overall 20% share of renewable energy source in final energy consumption, consumption by 2020. As you can see in this figure, um, although the EU on average just achieved the target by the end of last year, but many countries such as France and Poland are still for short of their country's targets. And what's worse, the, uh, according to the European Environment Agency, uh, the, the trend of decrease in greenhouse gas emission is expected to be slower in the next 10 years. And the, uh, in order to achieve the next, go, next EU goal of a 40% uh, reduction in greenhouse gas emission by end of 20, 2030, uh, the efforts need to be doubled compared with the current uh, emission reduction policies. So this simply suggests that more effort is needed uh, to achieve a complete energy transition. And in our research, we focus on uh, the potential of supporting renewable development through citizen investment. So one of the increasingly popular uh, business model in the EU is to finance renewable projects through energy cooperatives, which are characterized by energy localization and commitment to energy democracy. And the members uh, can enjoy a wide range of benefits. So um, we particularly interested in two uh, features of energy cooperatives uh, that we think can potentially attract investors. First, localized energy production uh, helps to build, uh, build up social trust in the local areas as, member are, as members are geographically closer to the project site and to the co cooperative committees. Uh, so it's easier for them to monitor the progress of the, the project, which reduces search costs. Um, and also citizens are emotionally uh, attached to the local labors. And, and, and it is likely that this type of uh, patriotic preference uh, causes uh, citizens to choose energy cooperative for renewable production. Second, uh, uh, traditionally in large and uh, private energy providers, consumers are only buyers of electricity and it is hard for them to, to monitor uh, 
how much electricity is actually produced from renewables, which creates a lemma market between buyers and sellers. Uh, and however, energy cooperatives allow for open and uh, voluntary participation and uh, members uh, of uh, uh, cooperatives uh, are allowed to participate in the decision-making process uh, of uh, cooperative important affairs, such as profit allocation and new investment decisions. Um, and this, this increased transparency uh, helps to reduce information asymmetry and thus uh, 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 may potentially contribute uh, to attracting new investment. So in terms of the investigation of uh, uh, citizens uh, of, uh, of um, uh, citizen perception of energy cooperatives, previous studies predominantly focused on the German population and potentially ignore the differences uh, in citizen perception in, in different European countries. And we closed the gap and uh, investigate citizens want to engage with energy cooperatives by conducting a large scale survey across multiple European countries. Uh, okay, so our research will, will answer the following question. What aspects of energy cooperatives are important to attract investors? And following the, the mechanisms mentioned above, uh, we propose two, hypothes two hypotheses. The first one is individual preference is positively correlated with project proximity. And second one is individual preference increases with active cooperative participation. So um, now turning to the, the data collection and survey design section. So we conducted the survey uh, among the general public in Germany, France, Spain, Sweden, and Poland uh, with uh, 600 respondents in each country, which gives, gives us a total of 3,000 respondents. So the survey was conducted on a popular survey platform called Cortrix and we added quarter controls so that the sample is representative in terms of age, gender, and regions. So the specific survey method we used is called discrete choice experiment. Basically, in a hypothetical context, respondents were asked to choose their preferred renewable projects operated by energy cooperatives from project A, project B, and the opt-out option. And in decision making, they have to consider all these uh, uh, attributes. Uh, for example, annual return, carbon reduction, and some uh, corporate characteristics. So this is uh, the four attribute table um, where uh, the panel on the left represents the, the attributes of the energy cooperatives that respondents have to consider in making trade-off. And uh, the panel on the right are the levels of attributes uh, that vary in different choice scenarios. So particularly, uh, we embed the information of carbon reduction emission and the, the corresponding project size in the same attribute based on the assumption that uh, the capacity of uh, carbon reduction is commensurate with the size of the project. So the bigger the project, uh, the more carbon it can reduce. So uh, there are eight choices like that for each respondent, uh, but the levels varied in different choice scenarios. So with this creature experiment, we are able to quantify the citizens' uh, individuals' preferences for uh, characteristics of energy cooperatives. So uh, uh, the choice modeling is based on the random utility framework where uh, individual utility is associated with the levels of the, the, the attributes of the chosen option, uh, which is observable to, uh, to researchers and an error term, which is unobservable to researchers. And uh, in order to account for uh, preference heterogeneity across individuals, we use, uh, we, we estimate uh, the choice data using a misc logic model. Okay, so now turning to the result section. Uh, as you can see this figure, uh, the panel on the left uh, are uh, characteristics of a typical energy cooperative, and the bars on the right uh, uh, represent to what, to what extent the alternative level is preferred over the reference level of the attribute. So the green bars means respondents have positive preferences, 
and the gray bar means uh, they have negative preferences. So the bigger the green bar, the more uh, they value an alternative level over the reference level. Okay, so for the first attribute, we can see that respondents prefer higher annual return from the invested renewable projects, which is quite sensible. And we also find that uh, they would like to invest in solar rather than wind technology. And in terms of the, uh, sorry, I just turned off my, uh, sorry about that. So in terms of the, the, uh, the carbon reduction and the project size attribute, um, we find that uh, the higher is the level of this attribute compared with the lowest level, the more uh, respondents prefer. And also uh, for the location attribute, which is related to our first hypothesis, we find that uh, individuals uh, do not care if the project is built within their region or their country compared with being built in the local area, but they are highly against the situation where it is built outside their country. So we cannot reject the noun of the first hypothesis for the within regional, within country uh, uh, project, but we can reject the noun for the uh, local versus our country comparison. So respondents also dislike some uh, investment requirements, uh, such as a higher minimum amount, uh, higher, higher minimum investment amount and a duration. And although energy cooperatives allow uh, members to, partic uh, to uh, participate in the decision-making process, it seems that uh, respondents uh, are not interested in those participation meetings. So in that case, we cannot reject the noun for neither the, the quarterly meetings or annual meetings. Okay, apart from the main attribute effects, uh, we also investigate whether preferences for the features of energy cooperatives differ across different social groups. Uh, we include uh, interaction terms between uh, individual level characteristics and some attributes. So for the individual characteristics, uh, we and yeah, I think uh, we lost you for some seconds. Oops. Uh, Okay, so let's wait just one minute and then if he doesn't uh, come back, then we will continue with the next presentation. Perfect. So let's just wait um, until 9.30, I think, I hope. That's really a pity. It was uh, very interesting to have this overview now. And uh, now he has been switched off. Hmm. Oh. No. I think uh, he doesn't seem to come back, right? Huh? No. Doesn't look good. Mm. Okay. Maybe, yes. Maybe we can, mm. if he comes he's back, he's back. He's back. Oh. Yes. Fine. Yes. Good. Sorry. Uh, sorry, the internet went wrong. Uh, I don't know if I can continue. Yeah, of course. We just okay. wanted to start with the next one, but you are just in time for continuation. So please okay. go ahead. Okay. So so uh, here for the heterogeneity analysis, uh, we include interaction terms uh, between individual could, could characteristics. You please, sorry, um, could you please share your slides? Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah. Yes, I'll change Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Great. Uh, so. So we include interaction terms between the individual characteristic and, uh, and uh, attribute variables 
Uh, I guess uh, here time is limited, so I just skip this and direct to the results uh, result table. As you can see, uh, if you look at the, the information within the red re rectangular, you will find that uh, although we find that people in general uh, do not are not interested in participation meetings, but those who uh, consider uh, decision rights in, uh, in, 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 uh, in individual in, uh, in the individual investment security uh, as important dimension are more likely to participate in meetings, uh, th those meetings organized by energy cooperatives. But uh, those with prior energy experience, uh, the effect is not significant at the 5% level. And all other attributes, uh, all other interactions, as you can see here, are not significant at 5%. So, uh, to explore to what extent individuals are willing to uh, to to sacrifice uh, any return in order to obtain a more desirable feature of an renewable projects, uh, we we can approximate uh, we can calculate willingness to willingness to uh, accept estimates by uh, uh, approximated uh, approximating the the uh, uh, marginal rate of substitution between annual return attribute and another characteristic of energy cooperatives. So as here you can see the, the results. Um, so if you look at the, the, the interpretation is a bit different from the previous figures. If you look at the first row, uh, you can see that uh, uh, if wind technology is applied uh, to, to the renewable projects, respondents would like to forgo a 1% annual return uh, to be able to switch to the more preferred solar energy uh, projects. So the uh, interpretations for other attributes uh, will follow a similar fashion here. Uh, can I ask the, the host how many times uh, left for me so I, I can decide where to present, uh, to present yeah, the rest of the You have uh, six minutes left. Uh, sorry, no. Um... Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, you so have, thank you, have, you. Well, you have two minutes left. Sorry, sorry, two minutes. Okay, okay. So uh, I intended to present some other res results, but because of an accident, I just skip those and directly to the the end. So uh, for the energy crown founder uh, model, actually, uh, we find that uh, investment decisions are motivated by both financial returns and environmental concerns, and. Um, we we don't uh, we we find that respondents do not like projects to be built outside their countries, and they dislike some investment requirements such as minimum amount of investment, and they generally uh, are not interested in participation meetings. But for those who uh, consider decision ma uh, decision making rights as important dimension in inv individual investment security are more likely to participate in meetings organized by energy cooperatives. Um, thank you very much. Any, any questions? So thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I have several questions, but I would open it for um, the panel, uh, so for, for the participants here. Um, are there any questions? Seems not to be the case, so I will start. Um, first of all, uh, let me let me start with a comment. Um, I, I have some questions with regard to some slide numbers, but slide numbers are missing on your slide. So um, maybe you can add them for the future. I, I have counted the slides um, on slide number six. Maybe you can go on slide number six. I hope that's right. This one? No. Um, Later, so it was um, <laughs> later, later, later. Um, so, so first of all, know where you showed the parameters of the experiment. Um, I think yeah, this one uh, number twelve. Sorry, number twelve. So, so number, this results. No, no, number twelve. Slide number twelve. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering whether these um, values of the experiment were were hypothetical ones or whether they were based on real values. Also, where you had on slide 14, where you have this comparison of, of different um, parameters, 
whether these are based on real values or just, uh, yeah, could you say some words about that? Yeah, so, so basically the experiment is based on the hypothetical scenario uh, where, so for example, uh, here in, in this slide, yeah, this is an example of the choice card uh, that was shown to respondents. So uh, basically uh, they see this choice card and they have to uh, make decision uh, regarding which project to yeah, choose. Okay. They can choose project A or B according to those characteristics uh, presented here. And they also, if they don't like uh, uh, both of them, they can choose to opt out. Okay. And did you also think about to make the values closer to real project uh, values? Uh, you mean how, do you mean how do I decide those levels, those values? No, 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 no. For example, if you look at project A, this is a solar uh, project, right? And now you could more or less gather data from real projects. So a real annual return rate from a project, a real CO2 reduction, which corresponds to the size of the project. So how much land is covered? And okay, you can assume, for example, a figure about minimum investment, but to be closer to to real to real values that that would that was my my main question yeah actually uh the, the according to the the um how the discretion experiment is designed actually those levels uh, are varied in different uh, uh choice scenarios so here you see this and maybe in the next choice you will see still the solar uh, solar project but any return jumps to 5% or jumps to 7.5%. So uh, the, the, the idea here is to, to see uh, how respondents react to, to different uh, renewable projects with different features. So, and I, I guess if I understand correctly uh, from the question, I, I think it's very hard to make every uh, okay, project reasonable. Okay. Yeah, and so then you need at, at the end it doesn't matter because you switch more or less the values um, randomly at the end and then it doesn't fit together if you would have real values. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, okay. the level vary in, in different trust scenarios. So yeah, basically yeah, I, the I, idea is to compare. Here right. the idea is actually to compare the difference between uh, levels. So the actual uh, well, the, the actual level does matter because if it looks too unrealistic, people will uh, um, doubt the uh, the realist the realism of the experiment. But from uh, ectometric perspective, uh, uh, here we focus on the, the 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 difference between the levels. Yeah, and how many participants participated in your survey? So basically, uh, let me show you here. So actually, we have three, uh, 600 uh, respondents uh, for each country. We have five countries, so uh, that gives us a total of 3,000. Uh, How did you engage these people? Because sometimes it's difficult to attract them for this survey. Do you have a, a survey database where how to contact or? Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, we use uh, Cortex uh, as a survey platform, and we also uh, collaborate. What, what? I didn't get it. What is it? Uh, the, the the survey platform is called Cortex, uh, and and we also collaborated with a, a panel provider uh, uh, to collect uh, uh, those samples. So here, the six hundred respondent means they are valid respondents. So they pro they completed the survey uh, with. Uh, I think valid responses. Okay. Yeah. And about your VT willingness to accept um, estimates, yeah. um, could you elaborate about the values itself? So next slide, uh, 27. Yeah. Um, what, so does, what, what does these values mean? This is in person. So one person more, or what? How? How do? What is the interpretation? What is the willingness to accept in this uh, in this field? Because for me, willingness to accept is always a value in euro per something. Yeah, actually, this is a very good question. So uh, in most uh, trust experiment uh, studies, uh, they present wants to accept or wants to pay in euro but here as you can see we don't have uh if, if you if you look at the choice card we don't have the actual uh a monetary uh attribute here so we we kind of use the annual return 
as as the monetary term but here uh, the, the issue is well it's not issue but uh, uh, here the, the difference between uh, this study and other studies are that uh, the annual return is presented in percentage yeah okay. right so yeah so it actually it depends on how much uh, money uh, respondents uh, sorry citizens uh, will invest so if if they invest for example 1000 euro and they have uh, annual return 2.5 they will end up getting 24 uh, euro each year um so so that's the idea but uh, we use the the term uh wish to accept because uh it's a kind of uh, mimic uh the idea of wish to accept uh, in which here we we define it as to what extent individuals are willing to accept a reduction in any return uh, in order to uh, obtain a more desirable feature for example sometimes uh, they would like to forgo a 1% annual return. They don't, they, they don't care about uh, okay. annual return too much, but they care about the environmental effect of a renewed project, for example, carbon reduction. And in that case, uh, uh, one should accept case gives the, 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 the trade-off ratio, the, the ratio between the, the okay. preference for two attributes. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. So there's one more question. I will give room for this one question. Christina Nienhaus. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's more a question maybe on the interpretation of the results. Um, I'm not sure in the last the last slide, I think it was, um, if the citizens dislike investment requirements, I'm wondering how uh, promising it is to build on energy communities to reach the transition goals. <laughs> but maybe I misunderstood a little bit um, this finding. It was, no, it was um, 20 something. Uh, in the last slide, your result, uh, not, not the, the results, it was um, the conclusion. Yeah, that one, key findings. Do not like the projects to be, no, it was the dislike investment requirements. Yeah, uh, thank you, Christina. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry, I think this is a yeah. very good question. Yeah, please go on. Yeah, it, it was just about, so if the citizens dislike investment requirements, so um, is it really promising to build on energy communities to reach the transition goals? I was not sure about, yeah, how to interpret this um, dislike, <laughs> because uh, that really goes then to, to the hard requirements. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, th thank you, uh, Christina. Uh, sorry, I think here, uh, maybe uh, more accurately, I should say citizens dislike uh, high investment requirements. So because yeah. if, you, if you look at uh, uh, our results, uh, you can see that, um, well, here, actually, I, I kind of uh, um, uh, aggregate uh, all the, the, the minimum investment levels together. So here, you can't see exactly uh, which level citizens dislike, but uh, but I can tell you that uh, for levels as as small as fifty euro, hundred euro, uh, citizens are insensitive uh, towards uh, oh, those okay. levels, which means that uh, they are okay if it's fifty or hundred, but they are against a uh, higher amount uh, of uh, minimum investment, such as five five hundred or one thousand. Um, here, because of the uh, space, uh, limited space, I don't present the. Mm -hmm. the okay, thank you. thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. much. Okay. Okay. So, um, thank you very much again um, for the presentation. So, applause. Thanks. And uh, we will come to the second speaker, um, which is Juan Jose Diaz, and he's a consultant in DNV. GL's energy markets and regulation team. And um, from his education background, I've seen he has studied at several lo locations, um, bachelor at the European School of Business in Reutling and also at the Universidad Pontificia Comillas in Madrid. And after that, he did a master's at different, different masters. So a first master in sustainability and social innovation at the Tech Paris and then in uh, economics of energy, natural resource, and environment at the Norwegian School of um, Economics. And now he will speak about renewable energy balancing, non-liberalized uh, electricity market. So the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much uh, for the introduction and for also the invitation to join this session. Um, I'm, I'm working, as you said, for DNV. DNV is one of the biggest consultancy companies in the energy sector, uh, distributed all along the globe. And I'm working uh, in the department uh, regulation, energy markets, technology. So we take, we're having a broad view on how uh, energy markets work. And then we're trying also to improve those energy markets by working hand in hand with developing institutions, but also governments and uh, ministries of energy and, regulat and regulators and so on. So this is what I've been doing for the last four years. And this experience and this knowledge I would also like, or part of this experience I would like to show you today. Uh, why this topic, first of all, is because most of the times when you look into, when, when you look into the papers that have been, or the research that is published, you normally find uh, a lot of information, a lot of research focused on liberalized markets, front runners, European, uh, Europe, European Union, US markets, uh, which is where you see more uh, renewable energy or variable renewable energy uh, getting integrated into a system. But then sometimes we forget that there are also other markets that are not so developed uh, in, in terms of market design, but also in terms of how much renewable electricity is uh, in their system. So we sometimes forget that these countries are also part of the energy transition and they also need to integrate renewables in the next years, especially uh, considering the targets that have been set and uh, also considering the, the Paris Agreement. And this is what I want to talk about today, how to integrate or how to improve the integration of renewables from the balancing perspective in non-liberalized electricity markets. So I've quickly uh, said that uh, I work for DNB. Um, I, I don't think that it's necessary to really go into and deeper into this, but uh, just to let you know that we are all over the energy value chain from the technical, regulatory, and also a financial uh, perspective. So let's speak first about a variable renewable integration in the electricity systems. Uh, so in a typical uh, power system, electricity is differentiated or electricity supply is differentiated in four uh, functions. You have at the beginning generation, then transmission, distribution and uh, retail supply to end consumers. So traditionally what we had in terms of flexibility for electricity systems is that you have very flexible plants that are uh, on the high voltage level, uh, providing flexibility to the system. But of course, with the introduction of uh, renewables or from the movement of conventional generation plants to renewable plants, we see that uh, there will be some changes in, the, in how this structure is working. And also this leads to some challenges. So first we see that uh, variable renewables, uh, wind, solar, they will be not just at the high voltage level, they will be also distributed along the medium and low voltage level. It means you can also have a solar, uh, as we just uh, discussed, a solar um, installation on your roof or in the community. And uh, this will be one of the characteristics of the, of the system. But of course, we know also that renewables are, uh, have two, two specific characteristics that they differentiate them from conventional plants. One is intermittency. It means that uh, the generation or the, the generation in the moment depends on the, on the wind and solar that you will have in this moment. And of course, it's uh, to some extent unpredictable or uncertain. You know? uh, all forecasts that you can do um, are even if they have improved in the last years, they're not, uh, they don't need to, to really materialize. So what can be done? You need to increase the flexibility in the electricity system. And this is something we have seen in, in, in different countries that are dealing with high, uh, high shares of renewable uh, generation. You can do it in different ways. First, by increasing flexibility on the generation side, it means higher flexible plants um, gas, hydro, typically in the past, but then also by integrating storage, energy storage into the system, and then also by providing other more new ways of providing flexibility, like for instance, a demand response, or also uh, if you're also uh, integrating end consumers into, into the system you know, to provide also some flexibility. Um, now, what we should understand is that uh, we have different levels of, of renewable 
generation in different uh, in, around the world, so in different systems. So we cannot put all the countries in the same box. Um, we have different structures of electricity system, different regulation or liberalization levels, and also different challenges. I, I like very much what uh, the IEA has done in this in in in, in the trying to categorize uh, countries by their uh, renewable uh, generation in the system. So we in, in what they have done is they have uh, created this ladder that you see here. So with the six phases, and they're categorizing uh, different countries based on their um, on the level of, of, of variable generation in the system. So we see that there we have very advanced countries in the, uh, in the phase four, which are Denmark, Ireland, for instance, then phase three, Spain, Germany, California. And if we go down to the first level where variable renewal is not uh, a big issue now, or it's not so noticeable in terms of impact to the system, we have countries like Egypt, Malaysia, normally emerging economies, um, that will see in the next decade a lot of uh, renewable generation coming into the system because they have also set very ambitious targets. So the problem of this uh, countries is that they will probably jump from phase one to phase three in the next 10 years. And this will originate uh, several challenges in terms of integrating renewables. And the question is how they could deal with this uh, variable uh, renewable generation. And what we want to do here is, uh, or at least in this time I have, I want to show you what we have, oh, what, what we have, what we can take from liberalized electricity systems, what the lessons we can take from those systems, and uh, maybe uh, implement some measures in this non-liberalized electricity system to allow them integrate better renewables in the future. Um, and focusing, since the, the topic is very broad, we, we will focus here on balancing, scheduling and balancing of variable renewables. Okay. So first, I would quickly like to show you how a liberalized electricity system looked like, and then we will move into non-liberalized electricity system, give also two examples, and then we move into the measures that we might or that we want to suggest of how to increase flexibility in non-liberalized electricity systems. So first, liberalized electricity systems. Um, typically, liberalized electricity systems, you find two categories. You have uh, centralized markets, or what uh, also called power pools, or you have decentralized markets. So uh, in a centralized markets, all electricity is generated and traded in a, in a single market platform. So the pool, so the direction is unidirectional, the directional is, is, is in one way. You have a generation, uh, elect electricity or generation is going into the pool and from the pool is going to the suppliers, right? The scheduling is centralized. It means that the market operator decides on the hourly, the hourly schedule of each unit and also the price. What you see here in this image is the Spanish example, uh, how the, the, the Spanish uh, system work. Uh, so what we, besides the pool, we have also the forward market. And uh, also after day ahead, you have the possibility or uh, generators and consumers have the possibility to go into the intra, intraday pool markets and in order to adjust their positions based on uh, variability of load and uh, generation. And so after at uh, real time, we have the system operator or the TSO that's, that dispatches uh, electricity according to the schedule and uh, the technical limits of the grid. Okay, so um, in this sense, uh, renewables have to participate in the day ahead pool, intraday pool, and they are allowed also to uh, adjust their position based on the better forecast and more close to real time. So this is the first uh, the first possibility or the first uh, system we see. This is also a system we, we find in uh, US, for instance, with some differences, but uh, it's it's based on the same on the of, on the same characteristics. Then we have uh, decentralized markets. Uh, so in decentralized markets, or what we also call uh, bilateral uh, contract markets. Um, generators and suppliers are allowed to get together and to engage into contracts or uh, contract obligations. And um, so these contract obligations, normally they have the delivery of energy and the um, consumption of energy as, as part of the, of the contract. And what is important here is that uh, participants have to self-schedule. So in this case, we do not need a control of a market operator, but it's based more on bilateral uh, trading. Okay. Um, now, in 
this is the system that you will find in many countries in Europe. Uh, Germany is one example. What you see normally is that there's also, besides the bilateral trading, there's also a complementary a voluntary power exchange or pool um, where, where also participants are allowed uh, to, to trade. And of course, also an intraday market. Uh, so um, since deviations are likely to occur, the transmission system operator does procure ancillary service in competitive markets also. And this ancillary service are normally provided by very flexible generation plants. But what we see in the last years is that this is also being provided more and more by um, demand response and also by, um, by storage. And this will be also probably the, what we will see more in the future happening as, as long as we, we, we phase out uh, conventional uh, generation. So the cost of balancing is then uh, recovered from the participants that are uh, generating these imbalances in the system. And what is important to note here is that variable renewables are also balancing responsible. So they have to really uh, try to uh, follow the schedule and uh, correct their position. If not, they will be penalized. Okay. And this is, of course, a, 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 an important uh, aspect because in this sense, a variable renewable needs to find ways to, to balance their positions. And uh, this is also triggering innovation and uh, flexibility, so to say. No? So you see that uh, renewables are getting together in portfolios or are uh, collocating uh, storage uh, capacity, or they're also closing some kind of contracts no? in, in the sense of uh, virtual power plants. So you're, you're, you're switching the responsibility of balancing to the balancing source. And this is of course a, a huge incentive to find new ways of balancing or innovating. Now, what happens in non-liberalized electricity systems? No? This is actually the focus here of this uh, presentation and the paper we have done. First, Non-liberalized system can be categorized also in two groups. We have on the one side vertical integrated utilities where we have a, a utility, a national utility that takes care of all the supply or the electricity supply. It means generation, transmission, distribution, and then finally supply to end consumers because the objective of this vertical integrated utilities is to provide a safe supply electricity to uh, end consumers. So here the quality is very important, not so much the cost. Everything is integrated. So, and since everything is integrated in one company, there are not many or there are no regulatory tools in order to incentivize variable renewable integration in this case. But this system has become rare because what we, we have seen since the 90s is that uh, this uh, vertical integrated utility systems have moved into what we call a single buyer model. In the single buyer model, we have competition on the generation side. And uh, this competition um, has been introduced in order to attract investment from uh, private parties. So when we have a, an investment into a generation plan, we call it normally uh, independent power producers. And those independent power producers plus other gener generation plans could be also public uh, generation plans sell directly to the purchasing agency, you know, which is uh, the single buyer. And the single buyer is then responsible for uh, scheduling. I think I have, is there a question? I see you in the chat, six minutes left. Oh, yes. okay. <laughs> okay, I will, I will uh, try to go faster. So this is what we have, two, two systems. I cannot move now, strange. Okay, so how are renewables integrated in such a single buyer system? Well, first, uh, this uh, renewables are normally or variable renewables have a PPA with a single buyer and they have a uh, uh, priority of dispatch and non-balancing responsibility. So it's what we probably would see in Europe with the feed-in tariff schemes. So renewables are implemented and they just uh, generate whatever they generate and they get a fixed price for that. And later on, the balancing is done by the system operator and this balancing costs are then passed to the end consumers through regulated electricity tariffs. So this is how it normally works. But of course, this uh, gives a little incentive for uh, improving the forecasting of this uh, variable renewables. And there is also a limitation in innovation you know, for this variable renewables in improving their, uh, their scheduling and actually following the schedule. 
So uh, what we have done uh, in order to shed a bit of light into what is going on in terms of single buyer systems, we have looked into two systems and I will really briefly go into this. We have looked into relevant economies that are growing with a high population and that they have a single buyer system in order to understand what are the challenges and what are the limitations here so that we can provide some uh, suggestions how to improve. Um, so we have on the one side, Egypt. Egypt is a very big uh, country, uh, one of the biggest in the, in the region in terms of population, very, um, uh, has a big uh, the economic growth and also ambition, ambitious renewable targets. So what we see in Egypt is that we have uh, the utility uh, company that has been divided in subsidies, but, and then we have some uh, private parties, uh, IPPs and renewables that are also uh, entering the market, entering this, this typical uh, single buyer market, how it works. So the single buyer does the scheduling of generation based on their costs. And, uh, and then uh, based on this cost, it determines the most efficient generation plans and also considering PPA clauses no, that have been uh, uh, signed. So at the end, the single buyer does the whole scheduling and decides on the most optimal dispatch. And the TSO is then uh, in, uh, implementing any imbalances or imbalance corrections that, that appear. Now we have also the peninsula of Malaysia. This is also a very interesting single buyer system where we have, which is a bit, it's a bit one, one step ahead of Egypt because there is also um, competition in the terms of uh, de deciding the day ahead schedule. So we have also a, a utility uh, or vertical, no, not a vertical, but a public utility that is, uh, has uh, the role of generating electricity, tra transmitting, distributing, and uh, supplying electricity. We have a single buyer that is ring fenced from this company and is doing also the, the dispatch. And then we have also a, a grid system operator that is uh, taking care of the stability in the grid. So what we see in, in, in Malaysia is that we have, of course, PPA generators that sell electricity to the single buyer, but we have also some merchant generators that are allowed to make some, uh, to provide some price uh, based bidding. And based on that, uh, the single buyer determines the least cost dispatch schedule. So there's some, a bit more competition in, 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 in the peninsula of Malaysia than in Egypt, but it's also a single buyer system. So now what, uh, what we need to understand is that, or the questions that, the, the question that we have is how to improve the balancing in this non-liberalized systems. And uh, we come up with some suggestions that we, that of course need to be assessed country by country because um, each country is very different in terms of regulation, energy system, and also balancing needs. So um, based on some assumptions, and uh, these are the assumptions we have taken. So from an economic perspective, it's true that a single buyer model should allow optimal dispatch, but this in reality is not happening due to different reasons, political, economical. Um, Shouldn't just a comment, you have one minute left. Okay, I well, okay, I, I put the clock and I, Okay, it's okay. I will. I will go faster. I thought I had three minutes on my watch, but okay. Um, so we have these assumptions, and based on these assumptions, which we don't need to go one by one, we have come up with this suggestion. So this is what we see as this is the status quo of a single buyer, right? We have PPAs. These PPAs are closed with the single buyer, and the single buyer uh, makes the dispatch, the the schedule, and the single the system operator then does the the final dispatch with. Uh, no, with balancing, but not balancing responsibility of generators. And then at the end, the, the electricity is, uh, is priced uh, on a regulatory uh, methodology. No? What we propose is to implement a balancing system, a parallel balancing system or ancillary service mechanism that allows to extract uh, more flexibility from the system. So we have seen in, in, in liberalized markets that generators have still flexibility that can be provided. So not the most flexible plans are need to be the one responsible for providing balancing services. And we also see that we have demand response, we have storage coming into the system, and even renewables are able to provide some flexibility. So if we uh, allow, or if we implement a parallel uh, balancing service mechanism, then this additional flexibility could be extracted from the system. Now we have also the, the possibility, as we have seen also in Europe, 
to uh, implement balancing responsibility. If we implement balancing responsibility on the generation side, also on the renewable uh, generation, uh, then we are creating an incentive to really look for more innovative ways of flexibility and really following the dispatch. So we see here different options where the variable or the variable renewable generator uh, gets together into a contract with a flexible plant so that uh, in order to balance the, 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 the generation of this uh, variable renewable plant. And uh, we see we have also an option where the variable uh, renewable generator is also gets together with a flexible large uh, consumer uh, that can provide demand response. This is also a possibility and that could be also uh, set as a, as, a, as a separate contract, if there is, of course, a uh, financial incentive to do so. And finally, we have also the possibility, as it's a bit more advanced, of creating a virtual power plant, where you have a generation, flexible, uh, non-flexible, also variable renewable, and uh, flexible uh, consumption. And this can be set together in the, what we have, for instance, today, as a balancing responsible party, and that could be then allowed to uh, follow better the, the schedule and uh, introduce more flexibility into the system. So, of course, this is uh, some options we see, uh, but of course need to be analyzed on a country by country basis and based on regulation, based on incentives, which will be the incentive, uh, the, the monetary incentive that uh, triggers this innovation and flexibility needs to be decided and needs to be uh, designed country by country. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, it's a very large topic with a lot of details, but I hope I could uh, give you some glimpse on, 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 on this very interesting aspect of, of the energy transition. So, okay, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, we have thank some a few minutes also for uh, questions. Sure. Oh, I have also some questions. Are there any questions? So I will I will start uh, then if there are none. Um, I would be interested um, because I'm I'm not familiar with non-regulated markets um, as you presented. Um, um, but in general, I also assume that in non-regulated uh, markets, there must be an incentive also for the conventional power plants to, to be more or less, um, um, to fulfill more or less the, the, the far plan. What's, what's the English name? Uh, so you the, know what? Yeah, the yeah. schedule, no? Yeah, the, of course. The schedule. Um, yeah. Uh, Maybe you can say some words about that and uh, sure. how how this is this is this uh, how the schedule is guaranteed for 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 the for the conventional ones and whether this is possible to just take it over for for the renewables. Yes, sure. Um, so in single bias systems, you have the it's uh, the schedule is, is is centrally decided by the single buyer. So at the end, uh, the single buyer has an overview of the whole system. No? The, uh, and it, this is why it's, um, from an economic perspective, it's very, it's very powerful because you can, you can balance the whole system as one. Um, and what, what is the flexibility that are pro is provided is decided or is signed in the PPAs. It means that the flexible generators, they will provide availability. Or they, they, they say, okay, this is my availability. And based on that, the... The single buyer will decide and will set the day ahead schedule, but then there are also clauses in the PPAs that determine flexibility or balancing services that need to be provided in case of need. Um, so actually what, what, what your question regarding how can um, conventional generators be follow the schedule, well in this case it's very easy for conventional generators to follow the schedule and because the schedule is determined by the by the single buyer. So the only way that they can just like go out of the schedule is by maybe if there's any uh, technical issue, no? if there's a plant that just like uh, goes uh, out because of technical problems. But the, 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 the main problem is renewables. Renewables in this system uh, provide a, 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 a forecast. The, the single buyer has also a forecast and then, uh, but they don't have any balancing responsibility in this sense. So in the PPAs, there's no balancing responsibility set on renewables. Now, um, balancing responsibility is all on the single buyer side. Now, how, but what we say is that even it, if it seems optimal from a 
holistic perspective. What we say is the single buyer has not so much the incentive to really trigger or to really try to harness all the innovation in terms of flexibility that exists in the system. So you have the PPAs, you have some services that are provided through the PPAs, but there are probably other uh, participants that can provide flexibility. And this is what we have seen in liberalized systems. No? We have batteries, we have demand response, and even renewables that can provide flexibility. So if we, if we introduce a, a system or a mechanism with a monetary incentive, then you can maybe harness this flexibility. Or if, you, if we provide balancing responsibility or some kind of balancing responsibility to the generation side, we can create also this incentive. So it's, it's a bit without going into an open market because it's not possible how to create an incentive in this very mm. non-liberalized systems. That's the idea. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Um, I, I, yeah, at, at, at the end, probably it's uh, a question of really having the right price there, right? Uh, right. Yeah, uh, which and is, uh, is maybe not that easy in these no, in these uh, uh, non market based markets, right? Yeah, it's not easy. But then, you, if you think about it, um, at some point, you will need to introduce something. You need to introduce some incentive. In in liberalized market, we have seen it. We have moved from feeding tariffs to feeding premium systems, right? So balancing responsibilities, uh, and it has worked. It worked. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but uh, in order to continue, I think there's a question from Sina, but I propose that uh, we can ask it uh, at the end if we have time, so we don't uh, yeah. cut short sure. anyone. Uh, no, Dominic. Yeah, uh, that's fine. Uh, so we skip the question to the end and now come to the third presentation, which will be given by Christina Nienhaus. Um, who is at uh, the German Aerospace Center and is the uh, co-leader of the Energy Economics Group at the Department of Energy System Analysis. And uh, she studied economics at the University of um, Marburg and will now give a presentation about self-reinforcing electricity price dynamics under the variable market premium scheme. So the floor um, is yours. Thank you very much. I was, uh, yeah, thank you for the introduction and uh, good morning, respectively, good afternoon. <laughs> um, yeah, I will give a talk on the self reinforcing electric electricity price dynamics under the variable market premium scheme, um, which is based on joint work with my colleagues Martin Klein, Christoph Schimitzek, and Ulrich Frey. And uh, yeah, thank you. Um, Juan, it was, I mean, there's really a lot about incentives and <laughs> so I can just continue maybe this uh, sort of topic. So this kind of uh, motivation, um, yeah, I'm repeating it. We had this in a lot of European countries, current transition goals comprise very high shares of renewables. Um, accordingly, uh, policies like feed-in tariffs have been in place uh, for yeah, many years and then many, um, countries to support investment, um, but to foster market alignment and also uh, balancing requirements. Um, yeah, um, over the last years, this has been widely replaced by the variable market premium. Um, I don't know if, how familiar you are with this, um, but as it plays quite a central role, I will just give you a very short introduction here. You can say, see a very simplified sketch of uh, the premium. It is paid for electricity, which has been sold on the wholesale market. Um, and it's computed as the ex post difference between the technology specific market value at the spot market. And um, over an accounted period, usually uh, averaged about um, uh, counting period of, uh, sorry, <laughs> averaged about account, <laughs> averaged about an accounting period, usually of one month and uh, targeted remuneration level. Uh, which is usually based on the specific levelized costs of electricity to ensure refinancing in German legislation. This is uh, called uh, the value to be applied. Um, however, in the course of the work on three project, uh, projects, uh, each based on scenarios with very high shares of renewables, I'm sorry, I have somewhere here to adjust my screen. <laughs> um, my colleagues and I, uh, we found uh, an effect uh, 
that we initially thought was a bug in our model, um, we observed um, highly negative uh, electricity prices and thus accordant um, high levels for the market premium. Um, but highly negative prices uh, usually indicate an overproduction, which actually does not happen in the simulation. And uh, the high premium uh, may jeopardize uh, the political acceptance for renewables. And uh, hence, these effects might counteract an effective and efficient further integration of renewables. To further elaborate this phenomenon, um, we set up first a mathematical model, which shows uh, that the problem of uh, falling market prices and respectively increasing premium uh, is inherent to its structure. Um, you can look it up in uh, our paper we published on this topic. Um, that will be cited, I think, in the last slide uh, in this presentation. However, I will focus on analyses we conducted with our agent-based electricity market model, Amiris. I'm sorry to demonstrate that this effect also arises under more complex and realistic conditions. Some words on um, our agent-based uh, simulation model for the electricity market, Amiris. Um, it allows studying the impact of sorry. It allows studying the impact of policy, energy policy instruments on the economic um, performance of power plant operators and marketers. Um, as an agent based, agent based model, it does not have a higher level objective function. The simulation results are generated from the interplay of the actions of the actors depicted as agents. Um, the model has an hourly resolution and the wholesale electricity prices are endogenously calculated based on the strategic bidding behavior of prototype market actors. I mean, there are really a lot of issues I would like to tell you about our model, but this last point uh, is the crucial one for, 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 for this talk. Um, as for the case of the variable uh, market premium, um, this is also considered in, in the bidding behavior. So we assume that bids uh, are set to equal the marginal cost minus the anticipated premium, um, as this bidding maximizes uh, the chances of being awarded and as uh, the price risk is being hatched due to the explained logic of the market premium. Um, one remark in advance, uh, in our simulation, due to technical reasons, uh, the trader actors assume the market premium for the current month um, to be at the level of uh, the previous month. So this is just maybe to, to understand afterwards some of the figures a little bit better. Um, we developed two generic scenarios. Uh, for this study, the simulations were conducted for one year and we took data for load and uh, PV and wind profiles from the open power systems data platform. Um, the aim of this first simple scenario is uh, to illustrate the principal mechanism um, of the effect discovered. In this scenario, we have only two generation technologies. We have 200 gigawatt of PV and 120 gigawatt of gas power plants. Uh, the carbon price was set to zero euro per ton. Um, and uh, the gas power plants marginal costs were fixed at 47 euros per megawatt hour. The resulting electricity prices um, in the scenario shown here on the right hand side, uh, the highest prices here I don't know, can you see my cursor? Um, the highest prices amount to the marginal cost of the gas fired plants. And in the first two and the last two months, um, there are no hours with a negative residual load, which is defined as the difference between actual um, power demand and the feed in of non dispatchable and inflexible generation, in this case, PV. As long as PV cannot cover uh, the load, the entire uh, the entire load, uh, gas power plants remain price setting uh, due to the merit order. But at the end here of the second months, um, with the beginning of spring, PV is able to set the price for, and the simulation was for five hours for February. Um, and as it is able to bid at marginal costs minus the variable market premium, um, bids are placed 
already in the second months um, at roughly minus 40 euro per megawatt hour, resulting in an equivalent price for, yeah, in the hours PV's price setting. Um, however, these negative prices continue to decline as long as PV is able to cover the demand. Um, what happens? I'm sorry. <laughs> due to the uh, due to the few hours with negative prices in month two, the monthly average market value of PV decreases for this month, as you can see here in the upper right side. Um, since the market premium uh, has to ensure refinancing, um, it has it needs to be increased accordingly, which you can see in the lower right side, and. Um, Again, in the next month, PV bits will include this increased premium and hence prices in the hours where PV is load balancing uh, become even more negative. This requires another increase of the premium and uh, this decline continues as long as PV covers the demand in such uh, a significant share of uh, monthly hours that its market value keeps declining. In autumn, gas, uh, becomes again price setting in most cases and the market value for uh, PV is um, increasing and the market premium is decreasing accordingly. So this was a very simple scenario uh, to examine whether this effect is also observable in a more complex setting um, in an extended scenario. Um, we developed um, yeah, quite a deliber deliberately generic scenario with a high share of uh, high shares of free variable renewables. Uh, more technologies were included in the extended scenario. So we have 200 gigawatt PV, 80 gigawatt of wind onshore, 20 of wind offshore. Uh, there are together 80 gigawatt of uh, conventional capacities and 20 gigawatt of storage. The carbon price was set to 50 euro per ton. Um, yeah, and here you can see the resulting electricity prices. Um, they fluctuate much more than in the simple scenario, but uh, the pattern of monthly decreasing um, stepwise, uh, yeah, stepwise monthly decreasing prices is still to be observable until the end of yeah, summer is evident here. Um, like in the simple scenario, conventional technologies dominate the market in the winter month. And however, also for January, you can see renewables already covering the load for the first months due to also to technical reasons, we assume a market uh, premium of zero um, euros per megawatt hour. Looking at the pattern of um, market values and uh, the market premium for PV, the results are quite similar to those of the simple scenario. The price dynamic gains momentum in month four, uh, where PV and wind technologies together cover the load for more than 140 hours. Um, but since PV feed-in is more synchronous than wind, the market values decrease even faster. Um, And due to the respectively increasing market premium and um, the strategic bidding behavior, PV can continuously lower its bids and its position, it is quite interesting, changes to the left end of the merit order. Um, this happens in the simulations in month four and is, yeah, the situation is kept until month 11. Um, during this period, um, PV is really awarded in every hour it bids um, PV, yeah, um, either at self-imposed prices or at those from wind and conventional technologies. So this extended scenario reveals following cross effects. The market value is even further for one technology is even further decreased by complementary renewable energy technologies. Since um, wind also bids negatively, the market value for PV decreases even more also in the hours where wind is uh, price setting and PV becomes, uh, and PV being price setting uh, pushes wind out of the market resulting in decreasing full load hours for wind. Um, yeah, we checked 
we made some sensitivity checks. I'll show you two scenarios, two other scenarios. So we have a high wind scenario. Um, you can see here in month six that we have an obvious doldrum in this weather year, um, which has quite an interrupting effect uh, on the reported dynamic, dynamic sorry. But nevertheless, you can see that uh, the price dynamic is clear for the first five months um, according to, to our extended or simple scenario. So comparatively. Um, and then we have another a high storage scenario where the capacity for storage has been doubled. Um, and there you can observe that the dynamics are slightly slowed down, but nevertheless, they still appear. Um, yes, these were the results. Um, there are three objections I would like to discuss. Um, one objection to the effect observed is uh, that it, oops, so that it is due to model artifacts. So as one assumption is um, that uh, the traders are bidding um, minus the anticipated uh, market premium. Um, this yeah is is this holding, but um, setting bids to equal the marginal cost minus the anticipated market increases increases the probability of being awarded, so it decreases uh, the volume risk, and since the market premium is uh, balancing the market revenues to the levelized cost of electricity, this negative bidding is virtually risk free. Um, Another objection would be that um, the simulations are stylized and simplified and abstract away important influences from the real world. Um, for example, the chosen scenario is relatively strong, um, has a, a relatively strong PV deployment and um, thus it may overestimate the self-reinforcing effect. But uh, however, we observe uh, the deflationary price dynamics and scenario with different proportions of technologies as well, like you could see in the high wind and high storage scenario. Um, another objection also could be that the growing demand from power to x technologies um, could delay the uh, you know, that the growing demand from power to x technologies um, would would would. Um, um, um sorry abstract away this effect but um yeah we think it is only to expected to delay the effect um since the share of the variable renewables is uh, the crucial point about the effect we discovered so last but not least uh, finally the price dynamics may be limited uh, by um, instruments and regulatory design itself like for example the so-called for our rule in germany according um to which the market premium is set to zero if prices at the day ahead auction are zero, uh, below zero in four and more consecutive hours. Or like, for example, you could cap premium at a maximum value. Uh, you could uh, switch to a, market, a fixed market premium. Um, these um, adjustment all would prevent the effect, but they would have undesired side effects, especially for the risk of refinancing renewables. So in the end, um, I would like to conclude, sorry, <laughs> that the variable market premium obviously distorts the market price formation for markets with high shares of variable renewables due to the self-reinforcing feedback loop of electricity prices once the variables become price setting. But the described dilemma is not trivial to avert in the current market setting as a voluntary change in bidding behavior is not to be accepted, expected. Um, upper and lower limits would jeopardize refinancing, and a fixed market premium would also entail immense investment risks. So this leaves two main questions that need to be um, answered in the future. Is the premium steering effect at very high shares of uh, variable renewables still efficient and effective? And how can refinancing be ensured in future? So if you want to look up our analyses in detail, you can download uh, the corresponding paper we published. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for the presentation. Um, are there any questions? I have also plenty of questions. <laughs>
<laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe a first question, because I didn't get the last point, is the premium yeah. steering effect. What do you mean with that? Um, so, if, as, um, as we're not sure if the, um, the effect we discovered were the highly negative prices on the one hand, so if they really indicate, I'm sorry, I lost here something, if they really indicate um, the scarcity of, of electricity still, so if is it still, um, um, does it have isn't, the- Isn't it more a surplus and then a scarcity? No, I'm sorry, the, the, the signal, the scarcity signal for the markets. So it, it doesn't work in the right uh, way anymore. So as I told you, because of the market um, uh, premium, PV, for example, can bid so negatively that it really moves to the left end of the merit order. So even the merit order changes. Yeah, but that's clear. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> but this is only due to political, uh, to, 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 the, to the policy instrument. Yeah, so yes. is it still an efficient and effective instrument? Because efficient, is it really, um, is it really giving the right incentives? And uh, on the other hand, is it really, um, um, from the political perspective, um, is it, can, it, can it hold um, because of so, also this rising, this immensely rising market premium, which yeah, has to be I, I paid by the consumers. Yeah, yeah, I think there are some some points in this question. Yeah. Uh, first, first of all, I assume in your model, you so it, it it doesn't change the situation at all. But of course, I think trade plays a crucial role because with imports trade, and exports, you have, yeah, you have a balancing itself, which decreases the effect, of course. Yeah. And yep. the other thing is also demand side flexibility. You said, okay, with power to get power to X technologies, the effect is later on, because yep. also with these negative prices, you stimulate new technologies on the demand side and providing this flexibility. Mm -hmm. So this is something probably which you assume quite fixed. So this is from a technical technical point of view. But yeah, when right. you, mm -hmm. so that, that's about the modeling itself. But from my mm -hmm. point of view, when you think about the situation itself, about renewable integration, and if you think about uh, market, long-term market equilibrium, so what is the long-term yep. market equilibrium, then you can distinguish two situations, a real long-term market equilibrium where yep. all capacities are endogenously determined. Then it's yeah. a question of how high is the CO2 price and which technologies go in equilibrium. And in this equilibrium, of course, the self-marginalization of renewables is fully taken into account. However, this is politically not intended currently because we don't believe in CO2 prices. We believe in um, renewable expansion pathways. And if you think in renewable expansion pathways, then renewables are always exogenously given as it is in your model. However, if it's when it's exogenously given, then you always have the problem that the market itself is completely distorted at the end if you have that high amount of renewables and then you always end up with the problem of significant surplus, except for if you have significant storage technologies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe I also put you one paper of us in this chat, which discussed this, this point of self-marginalization, which could be of interest for that, you. Yeah, thank you very much. That would be very interesting. Yeah, and you're right. We also thought about, I mean, we didn't pay attention now to, to imports and exports and neither to, to demand side management. And this is something we are, yeah, we will be happy to, um, to, to, to model also in, in, in future times. Um, but we think that they would maybe slow down the effect, but nevertheless, as I'm, um, as I have been uh, stating for the power to X technologies that the share of variable renewables is essential. That holds true also for, for whole Europe if you, if you take the European case. And um, I think we had in June, 2020, um, then we had, I think also a kind of ne negative residual load um, all over Europe. Mm. That might be, and in fact, maybe not, not that sharp at, as it is now, um, yeah as I have been presenting with our simulations. Um, yeah, with the surplus and, and, and you're 
you're right and and uh, the exogenous uh, renewables but um the question which which is int which is interesting to us is really how how can we organize such a market because we need some kind of energy only market for the efficient uh, dispatch but um the renewables somehow have to have a kind of a refinancing perspective and um this is quite a discussion at the moment and also, I mean, uh, we had this four hour rule has been a six hour rule beforehand and it was discussed um, to, to, to set it to a, um, a one hour rule. <laughs> but um, this is really, um, yeah, increasing the risk for refinancing as uh, the full load hours also uh, are decreasing accordingly. Mm -hmm. And yeah. As I said, yeah, I, it's, I, I see it's, it's an open question. <laughs> I, I see your point. At the end, I wouldn't say that negative prices are that bad at the end because no. in, in the market itself. So so the point mm -hmm. is you, you really mm -hmm. have this, this market distortion. And at the end, uh, if, if you would say they, they have uh, marginal costs at zero, so they would always bid at zero, but uh, yeah. That wouldn't help. A bit negative, that, that's even better, I would say, because then there's an incentive to invest in storage. At yeah, the end, I... what you need, because it's a, it's a strong signal saying there's too less, uh, too less storage possibility mm -hmm. or too less demand side management. And the lower the price, the better for these mm -hmm. technologies, the more the incentives to, to go ahead there. That would, mm -hmm. be the, that would be the solution because else, you will not solve the problem from a system perspective because then you always have a surplus of renewables and nobody cares about it, right? So nothing mm -hmm. could happen then. I agree, absolutely. Uh, it was only about what, what we really were very um, yeah, <laughs> surprised by were these very highly negative prices. So we had in some of these scenarios uh, then an average price of minus 200 in euros and so on. And yeah, that was really the is, thing. This is, a, yeah. this is, this is modeling. Model issue, out of, yeah, 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 yeah. Because you have Might no be, demand yeah. side, you have no trade and and you assume a situation, it's, it's more or less future situation and not step by step because you have a path dependency coming from today and developing in this direction, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the projects I've been talking about, they, there we really had more complex uh, scenarios. So this okay. was really only the analysis on the uh, self-reinforcing price dynamics. Um, so yeah, we have been coupling our model to an optimizing model, which has been anticipating also demand side management and the uh, okay. trade and so on. So, and nevertheless, this effect occurred. So this is just, yeah, something we want further to, to work on and, and I agree completely. I'm, I'm not against uh, negative prices at all, but this really self-reinforcing price dynamics due to the market premium, we really wanted to analyze yeah. and have a look yeah. at. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that, that will also continue. If I may okay, say yeah. something here, I mean, yeah, um, sure. just Please a go quick, ahead. quick comment. <laughs> um, I mean, what we will see in the next years is that we're moving more away from the feeding premium. We're actually seeing that, and we are moving mm -hmm. more into merchant projects. Merchant projects mm -hmm. will not have the effect of feeding premium. And in that case, there is also not so much incentive no, in negative pricing. You also say that we have this, uh, this four hour rule in Germany. Actually, this rule. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not so sure if in all markets negative pricing uh, or negative bidding is allowed. So yeah. that, that could be also yeah. a possibility. Uh, sorry, to, to, so, yeah. sorry to interrupt you, Juan Jose, but uh, we, we, we need to start the last presentation. Yeah, let's go. Because, yeah, sorry again, it's a really interesting <laughs> conversation. Okay, we thanks really, again. Yeah, we also can take the time after 11 if there's the need for exchange, no problem. But yeah, let's continue with the... Um, <laughs> last uh, speaker today. So now the presentation will be given by Sovia Bertisheva. I hope I pronounce it correctly. And uh, she's a PhD student um, at the Tung School of Management at the Center for Energy Markets and uh, is now presenting about the topic firm perspective on energy transition, energy projects, portfolio formation. So the floor is yours. Yeah. Uh, thank you for introducing me and 
Hello, everyone. So the presentation is organized in the following way. First of all, I will give you the motivation behind the topic. Then I will provide a short literature review. And after that, the model will be introduced and it will be followed by the results. Okay, so during the last decade, the fossil fuels industry is facing growing pressure from the public investors and industry. And of course, it kind of forces the industry somehow to react to that pressure. And that is why the goal of our work is to investigate the trade-offs faced by fossil fuel industry investing in the alternative low carbon technologies, transitional and established fossil energy projects. Especially we are interested in, first of all, understanding how investor preferences and technological uncertainty may affect the allocation of capital. And second, we are investigating the interplay between costs and availability of capital for diverse projects meaning fossil fuels versus their projects which are related to alternative sources of energy. So the public may influence the fossil fuels industry through government and, or through investors. In the first case, the pressure from public is embodied in mass protests and petitions against fossil fuel companies. Some of those protests may impact on government's decision about the usage of plant, for example as it was in Australia where environmental opposition caused a ban on hydraulic fracturing in several areas. In addition to that, the pressure may be done through the investments from investment funds that, uh, that collaborates with fossil fuel industry in general. It was found out that in the USA, the share of responsible investments has grown. Thank you. 10 times uh, from 2008 to 2018. Uh, this public demand is held by the large investors funds as well. Uh, for example, the BlackRock investment management, management company uh, claimed that it plans to sell all of its uh, shares in producers of fossil fuels, especially in term of coal, but uh, they haven't so far, but they still kind of uh, moving in that direction. So the fossil fuel industry faces pressure not only from the public, but from, from the government itse itself. It may be proved with a number of laws and acts uh, and agreements that were signed during the last decade. Some of them are aimed at all, all degrees of greenhouse gas emissions, while others are aimed at protecting the land, for example, from hydraulic fracturing. Finally, some countries such as Canada, France, and the UK committed to creating all coal plants uh, from their territories completely. The investors are pushing the fossil fuels industry to change its business as well. It may be explained by several factors. First of all, the annual total return that is gained from investments in fossil fuel industries. Um, it is um, orange in this picture was lower during you know, 2014 to 2018 in all years by 2016. Then the average annual returns of S&P 500 index, including excluding oil and gas companies. However, the dividend yields that were paid by oil and gas industry were always higher during the same period. So they were compensating uh, with uh, dividends for the lack of their returns. In addition to that, the divestments from fossil fuels may have a positive effect on the company's image for the customers. Again, uh, a lot of customers tr um, uh, asking investment funds to take an action to be more sus sustainable and to take the, res the responsibility um, for, the, for the investments. Okay, that being said, let us move on and consider a reaction from the fossil fuels industry. A lot of oil majors, including companies such as Shell, Exxon, and Equinor, have launched projects that may be considered either as green ones or that, or that reduce the damage from fossil fuels. For example, Shell invests a lot 
invest in a um, hydrocarbon mobility project in Germany, Equinar invest in floating wind farm in Scotland, the Exxon has claimed to, to use wind and solar energy for crude oil extractions, and there are a huge number of such an example where oil majors invest money in green technologies. In addition to that, there are some examples of companies that have switched their core business from fossil fuels to power generation or power distribution, for example. Uh, and um, one such a company is Oyster, uh, which is which is now the largest uh, wind generation firm in um, Denmark. Uh, however, for oil, for major oil and gas company, the share of investments in into low carbon technologies is still um, low. According to the IEA, it was lower than 5% of total energy sector investments, but still it's kind of growing. Our research contributes to the following uh, strands of literature, firstly to the exhaustible resource theory, which is focused on optimal resource depletion. Some papers that are focused on optimal depletion uh, tries to answer how no, sorry, some papers that are focused on optimal resource depletion are trying to understand, okay, what should be the speed, uh, how the depletion uh, should be made, meaning in which period, what amount of the resource uh, should be extracted by pretty frequently the introduction of new technologies is omitted in that uh, kind of literature. Secondly, our research con contributes to the literature on project financing that considers how a firm should allocate available funds across a set of projects to maximize its profit or value. However, this literature is not taking into account that the number of projects that can be financed by a firm uh, can be not only limited by the, by the firm's budget, but it can be depleted. And uh, finally, our and, and that being said, the main goal of, the, of this research is to build a bridge between exhaustible resource theory and leverage on project financing. And finally, our um, research contributes to the stranded resource uh, literature, which tries to determine what is the optimal speed of resource depletion, given that resource itself may be abandoned due to the availability of better technology or because of some regulational changes. Okay. In given research, we have considered a rational risk neutral firm that maximizes its value, which consists of net profit or assets at hand and the value of growth assets. The value of growth assets is uh, driven by the following factors, future output prices, cost of capital, expected changes in the regulation, and expected changes in technologies that are available. We are assuming that the firm chooses in what projects to invest, given variations in productivity uh, and profitability across the projects. In addition to this, the more funds are invested in a certain type of projects, the less resource is available for the investments in the future, meaning that by investing in a certain type of project, the firm uh, depletes it. Finally, one of the most important assumptions in our model is that no matter in which types of projects a company invests, the output price is the same across all the type of projects. So here we are kind of uh, going away from a customer's preferences on, on, uh, on the form of energy that will be consumed. Okay. Uh, three groups of projects were considered in this research. They are denoted as established, transitional, and alternative ones. Established and transitional projects are competing for the same exhaustible resource. However, the technologies that are used for the extraction are different. It is assumed that the projects in a transitional group cause less harm for the environment. One of the most famous examples is the usage of carbon dioxide as a gas for enhanced oil recovery. Another example is Chevron Shell Total and Adam Oil Majors that use renewable energy to extract crude oil. And alternative type of projects, you know, the projects that use alternative resources and technologies. So for example, it, it is the projects that are related to the green energy, for example. Uh, the model allows considering different scenarios 
where the cost of capital will be the highest for the established project, followed by the transitional and alternative ones. Finally, the productivity also varies across the project, assuming that the established projects show the highest productivity per unit of invested uh, capital compared to the other projects. Uh, so in the model, it is assumed that the most of profits will be earned to the realization of projects in established and transitional group, while the gross assets are driven by the realization of alternative projects. Total profit is equal to the sum of uh, total um, value of a firm is given by the profit that was earned in the current period and uh, growth assets or assets at hand. Total profit is equal to the sum of money that is earned in every type of project minus the interest expenses. The sum of money is equal to the product of the output prices, time and investments, the productivity per uh, unit of investments. The equation for the growth assets, which is given here, um, uh, reflects several things. Uh, this component uh, reflect that actually the total available resource may be changed due to, due to technology, technological improvements. Uh, here we are account that actually there is some learning by doing within the film. Uh, the, rate, the rate of uh, this learning by doing is denoted by beta. Again, uh, the, the speed of the learning by doing may be varying across different types of projects. Uh, uh, Q, um, Q is um, productivity per unit of investments and K is investments in given types of projects and uh, gamma is the discount rate. Of course, we uh, have introduced uh, two uh, constraints. First one is a uh, budget and second one is of course the resource one, the budget constraint is represented by a sum of investments in every type of project weighted by projects related productivity. The total amount of investments should not exceed the profit from the previous period times external financing parameter F. When F is greater than one, a firm attached external um, attracts external financing. When F is less than one, a company pays dividends. When F is equal to one, then it neither pays dividends nor attracts new debt. The capacity constraint should be applied only to the project in established and transitional groups, again, because of our assumptions. Again, the projects in those groups are competing for, for the same resource, and that's kind of, uh, that's, but the total expenses that can be done in those two groups um, are different, and that's why we have introduced this parameter omega that accounts for those uh, differences. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, since our goal is to maximize the value of a film, given a set of constraints, the Lagrangian was uh, constructed and it was solved for four cases that are kind of introduced uh, here in the table. And so four cases were considered. First one represents the case when the film is not limited in the available finances and is and is constrained in the resource that is available. The second one represents a case when a firm is not limited in the resource, but is limited in both um, resource and, oh, sorry. Yeah, the second case uh, represents the case when a firm is um, unlimited in amount of projects, but uh, limited in the um, uh, funds. Uh, third case uh, represents the case when a firm is not limited in both finances and available projects. And the last case uh, corresponds to the case when the firm is limited in both the finances and available projects. Each of those cases can be um, understand as different, for example, life stages of a firm, or it may be correspond to the firm of a different size, etc. Okay. Uh, here the share of uh, here I uh, have some results. Uh, here the share of total firms value is represented. First of all, I would love to provide you a case where all the characteristics of projects are the same across, across every type of project. In this case, the solution tells us that the firm should invest evenly 
in every type of available projects, meaning the alternative is established and transitional one. However, one may see how the shares of every type of project would be changed if we start to change productivities across every type of project while keeping the same all other parameters. In the third case, uh, where we have assumed that the productivities are different for every types of project and the productivity of the alternative project is the lowest one. And our model tells us that uh, in this case, uh, the investments should be split only between the alternative and transitional ones, eliminating, or sorry, uh, in this case, the investment should be split between the established project and transitional one, completely eliminating the alternative ones. Okay. So uh, this set of figures, um, with this set of figures, I would love to illustrate the distribution of the funds across a set of projects when we keep all the parameters the same while uh, changing the discount rate, similar to the case uh, with the productivity of alternative projects. Um, uh, have the highest discount rate and the investments into them will be equal to zero. Yeah, so basically here I just write uh, the discount rates and yeah, everything was kind of kept, um, kept um, more equal to each other. Uh, however, the differences in the discount rates may be compensated by the productivity, for example, and that's how I've, um, uh, I've depicted this figure here. And so basically it tells us um, that it's not only important what are the productivity, but what are the expectations of a firm with regard to a specific type of projects. So in this uh, research, we have proved that when a firm wants to maximize its value, it should make decision, decisions uh, based on expectations on the future changes in regulations, for example, for example, because sometimes for a firm it, it will be, it will be it may be very important, especially if we are discussing the companies that are engaged into the, into the extraction of fossil fuel energy. And yeah, and we have uh, introduced a model that accounts for the technological improvements over the time as well. And only a combination of a firm's expectations on the future with the current level of technology, of technology rules a firm's transition uh, to, uh, to the alternative energy. And basically that's it. Thank you for your attention and thank you for your time and thank you for uh, listening to my presentation uh, do you have any questions so thank you very much for your presentation are there any questions if not i can also start with some So um, my, my question is a little bit more um, on an aggregated level, I would say. Um, as, you, as you said, the basic question at the end is if uh, such companies which were strongly engaged in oil and gas industry, um, they have to, on the one side, care about their old business model. Um, and on the other side, of course, um, go with the time and, and invest in, in, in new business models. So for my understanding, um, I, I want to know, um, do you have any feeling about which pressure also comes from the, the, um, the financing itself? So is it is it uh, is there really more or less? So that, that would mean at, at the end uh, that um, uh, money for for conventional projects um, you would have to pay a much higher price than for green projects but i assume this is not the case but but i'm not experienced in this field maybe you can say some words about the refinancing of of um, oil and gas companies and and how big the pressure is from finance industry 
Uh, thank you for your question. And indeed, you're completely right. Actually, again, if we take a look at the annual um, total returns that are maybe earned by the oil and gas companies, which is uh, orange line here, yeah, it's uh, significantly lower uh, than. What, what, what do uh, the colors mean here? Uh, well, we have orange oil and gas companies, and the dotted line is uh, S&P 500 index. Okay. Yeah, and actually we can see that uh, investors is indeed pushing on the oil and gas technologies because for them it's kind of uh, a win-win situation if they divest if they divest from fossil fuel assets because because of that they kind of uh, can uh, still earn, earn a lot of profit from um, on IT sectors, on average, in average on the market, etc., without engaging um, into the fossil fuel industry. And in addition to that, it kind of improves the um, reputation. In but, but this is this is just a dividend yield. It could also come yeah. from a higher risk at the end because of the long term yes. investment issues. Um, yes. Can you distinguish and it actually, or not? Yeah, actually, it, thank you for your question. Yeah, it is the case that the cost of capital is usually higher for the fossil fuel industry because, first of all, it is um, um, there are a lot of risks uh, during the development of the resource itself. In addition to that, again, it's not um, uh, that terrible from the perspective of the uncertainty in the future changes in the regulations, etc. And in addition to that, there are such a thing as a green bonds that usually have lower interest rates and which is aimed exactly at at a better at a at a, at a green project. Yeah. And uh, sorry. Is, is it also yeah. because um, extraction costs are increasing? I mean, it's not so easy to get now, for instance, fossil fuels, right? You need to dig deeper and uh -huh. uh, go a bit into more dangerous yeah. uh, regions. On the one hand, yes, but at the very same time, the technology will improve dramatically. For example, again, if we are talking about the hydraulic fracturing, it was developed only a kind of starting, well, it was uh, really scaled up only during the last 15 years. Yeah. So basically, that's kind of why it is also important to understand how the technology is developing over the time and to account for that fact. I, th I think this is a very interesting this is a very interesting conclusion huh? because many think many people think yeah technology is improving so much for renewables but actually it's also improving a lot for conventionals and conventional extraction yeah. and this needs to be taken into account of course yeah and again the longer a firm kind of stays at the same field the better it knows uh, what propounds well uh, what propounds to use uh, what amount of water to pump it into uh, each well, etc. So basically, um, each firm kind of performs learning by doing in this case. Yeah, so kind of that's kind of re really important too. And again, there is only a trade off okay, should you extract the oil right now, or should you uh, wait a little bit more and um, uh, wait for technology improvements across the across the industry and then to join into that kind of better technology so yeah okay um are there further questions so this doesn't seem to be the case so then thank you again for the presentation thank you again for all the presentation I think we had a very nice session because we had a lot of discussions and, and that's, that's, I think, the crucial point if you go to a conference. Um, in, in that sense, um, I hope you enjoyed also the session and I wish you also a, a nice continuation um, of um, the conference today and the rest of the day. So thank you very much and bye. And all of you who want to stay I think in the session to further discuss um, could stay. I have to excuse because I have a next uh, meeting, so I have to go out, but if you want to stay. So thanks again and bye.
Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks, thanks a lot for the link. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.